Are you looking to add interactivity to your holiday display? Well, stick around because today we're making this post button podium. Christmas, Halloween, residential or commercial. A push button podium is a great way to engage your audience and promote social media activity. When people interact with your light show, they take pictures and video and upload it to social media. That creates visibility for you and your brand. Today, we're gonna to go over the physical build of this podium, as well as a piece of software called Falcon Pie Player, which can be used to control the lights in your light show. So let's get started. For this build, we're gonna need the following materials. Three two by fours that are eight feet long, two four foot by two foot project panels that are quarter inch thick, a two foot by two foot project panel that is half an inch thick. We're gonna need some patch wire, female quick disconnects, some black paint, the Raspberry Pi input extender from Experience Lights, and five big LED buttons also from Experience Lights. The first step is to cut the two by fours into the proper lengths. The detailed measurements for everything we're doing today are available at experiencelights.com. Now that the pieces are cut to size, we're gonna trim off the ends of the longer pieces at a 45 degree angle. Fun fact, you can use all the scrap material you have left over and make a boat. All right, these are looking great. Time to move on to cutting the panels. All right, we're gonna cut out our top panel now, the board that's actually going to be mounting the buttons. We're using our two foot by two foot board here and we're gonna cut it down to 14 and a half by 16 inches. Since this panel is going to be on the top near people's hands, we're going to go ahead and just sand off these corners and make them nice and smooth. Now we're going to cut the front panel, which is 15 inches by 37 inches. All right, and our last two panels are 47 inches tall by 12 inches wide with two 45 degree angles at the top. Now you can see the podium is really starting to take shape. We have all of our frame pieces cut and our paneling cut. But before we get to assembling, we're gonna start with the top piece and actually attach our buttons to the top. Before we drill the larger holes, we'll drill some pilot holes just to make sure we have a nice clean center. Before drilling out the holes, make sure the bit you're using is big enough to fit the center shaft of the button. I would highly recommend drilling from the top side down to the back side just in case you have a blowout. Ask me how I know. All right, the top piece is done. Now we're going to start putting together the base. I'm gonna lay out the pieces just in their general locations first, just to make sure everything's a clean fit.
Now that the side panels are assembled, we can add the base so that this can stand up on its own. Well, this is coming together really well. I'm really excited about this. Um, the frame looks great. Uh, now what we need to do is put on the front panel. But before we do that, we have this cross beam. Remember, we have one piece that's 14 and a half inches. And what that is for is to go right here in the middle, in the front. And what that allows us to do is use this as a lifting bar. So we're gonna actually attach this first, and then we'll attach the panel in front. Now with this cross beam in place, you can see how easy it is for you to be able to lift and transport the podium. Now we can clamp on the front panel and secure it in place. So the last thing we're gonna do is um, add on the additional screws here on the sides and then we'll do some touch-up sanding, and this frame is ready to go. Before we paint, it's always a good idea to give everything a good sanding, make sure everything's nice and smooth, and uh, you have a nice clean surface to apply the paint. While we let the paint dry, we can move on to wiring the buttons. There should be five LEDs, each with a corresponding color for the button that they go along with. And we're going to take these LEDs and stick them in these black housings. Now you can stick them in in either direction, but for me, um, I like to make sure and keep it consistent. If you look at the LED closely, on one side there is one wind, and on the other side there are two winds. Um, the one with two winds is the positive lead of the LED, and the one with one wind is the, is the negative or the ground. So I'm going to keep the positive side on the larger side of this black housing, so I always know that the large side is my positive side. Here we are snapping in the switches into the housings. They should have two pegs that align themselves and slide right in and snap into place. Um, you shouldn't have to force it too hard, but once it's in there, it is very, very snug. All right, all the housings are assembled, and now we're ready to make the wires for the ground wire, which is gonna connect all of the, the negative leads of these LEDs together. I'm cutting my wire lengths to just about eight inches, just to keep enough space between each of the buttons. In order to be the most efficient with our wire, we're going to be sharing these quick disconnects so that we can daisy chain from LED to LED. For the red wire or the positive voltage, we're going to be doing the same daisy chaining, but we're gonna have one extra small wire that's going to patch up to the common terminal of the switch. We'll make those smaller wires only four inches long. I 
At this point, I'm most certainly putting too many wires into this quick disconnect, but this isn't really moving around a lot. I'm not too concerned with it. Get off my back. First, we're going to take the red wire or the positive wire and connect all of the switches together. We're going to start with the pink quick disconnect. We're going to connect that to the common terminal of the micro switch, which is at the very bottom of the switch. And then we're going to take the other terminal and connect it to the positive side of the LED. Remember, we put the LED with the positive side on the longer end of the housing. Now that all the positive wires are hooked up, we can hook up the black ground wire to the negative side of all of the LEDs. Now is my favorite time when we get to test all of our wiring and make sure all of these LEDs light up how we expect. All right, yeah, all of our LEDs work. That is exciting. Now we're going to move on to these little patch wires they're gonna be between eight and 13 inches long, depending on how far away we are. And it's gonna connect from our input extender node to each of the micro switches. We're gonna hook it up to the normally open contact or NO as it's marked on the switch. Press in the switch and rotate clockwise. Once it's seated, press the button and make sure that it is engaging the switch properly. Now we'll push all the wires through this little gasket here so that they can enter in the housing while the housing is closed and then we'll screw in all of the wires to their proper attachment points. Now when connecting the yellow wires, it really doesn't matter which input terminal you use. I would just avoid the second terminal because um, if you want to do pixel output, that actually is shared with one of the pixel output um, GPIO pins. So we'll want to make sure that it is the upper contact of each of those terminals and uh, we'll just avoid terminal number two. All right, we are almost done with the wiring. The last step here is we're going to just snip this little gasket here so that we can fit our Cat5 cable in, and after that Cat5 cable is connected, we are done with the wiring. The podium is done, the wiring is done. We're now just gonna attach the top panel on and move on to connecting this up to a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi input extender comes with a Pi hat that you can attach on top of your Raspberry Pi. It comes with these standoffs so that you can secure it to your Raspberry Pi and not worry about it wiggling loose. The input extender can get its power from the 5 volts on your Raspberry Pi as long as you don't exceed 500 milliamps. But especially for these big LED buttons, it's recommended to use an external 12 volt power supply 
um, especially because you'll be able to get some extra distance out of that as well without too much voltage drop. When you are using an external power supply, just make sure and switch the jumper such that it's getting the power from your 12 volts instead of the internal 5 volts. Before you plug in the Cat5 cable, I highly recommend cutting off this little shroud that is the bane of my existence. You don't even need to power up the Raspberry Pi to see that the voltage is getting passed to the buttons correctly as soon as that Cat5 cable is plugged in. That means everything is wired correctly. Now we'll just test each of these buttons and make sure that the corresponding LED lights up on the Pi Hat. Okay, the main build of this podium is done. Now it's time to get into the software configuration. So let's get into Falcon Pi Player. Falcon Pi Player is a free piece of software, open source, that you can download from GitHub. Um, typically, I always search on Google for FPP releases, and um, it's usually the top result for that. Um, and when you scroll down to the latest release that is listed, you'll see um, some assets here, and you're gonna be looking for the FPP Pi image. And uh, then depending on your platform, you'll use a piece of software to flash this image to an SD card so that you can run FPP on your Raspberry Pi. So I've already done that step. We have a fresh install of Falcon Pi Player here. And uh, we're gonna get started by uh, first setting up um, some uh, pixel strings. Now, what I'm gonna be showing here and what I'm gonna be demoing is, is not even necessarily recommended. Um, but you can actually run pixels straight off of your Raspberry Pi without any Pi Hat or intermediate hardware, um, just by using the GPIO pins. And a little trick you guys might not know about is um, on the top right, you see this says press F1 for help. When I'm on this pixel strings here, I'm gonna hit F1. And it brings up a very detailed help for the page that you're on. Highly recommend you take a look at this if you're ever needing more information about um, different options on a specific page. Um, but you can see here for the WS2811 output, um, you can hook up data string one to pin 12 or GPIO 18, and data string two to pin 35, GPIO 19, ground to pin 25. And you're not gonna apply the pixel power to the Raspberry Pi because you're going to be injecting that from an external source. So we've already done that. We have two strings that are being um, uh, con uh, connected to our Raspberry Pi. Uh, I know for, since uh, I'm the one that built the model, that our first string has 400 pixels. And I actually have no idea how many pixels are on the second string, so I'm gonna just say 400, because I know that's too many. Um, and we're gonna just bump this brightness down, because we don't need it that bright. And we'll enable the Pi Hat. Um, it says this is a cape type um, of Pi Hat, even though we're not using a Pi Hat, it will still work just fine. Um, again, all I'm doing is driving GPIO straight out of here. And right away, I don't have to really do anything else. Um, I can go to display testing and we're gonna just, you can do an individual string if you like, or specify individual channels. Um, but just for the sake of this test, we're gonna just enable test mode and right away you see that the, the lights are doing a pattern, a test pattern. So we have the um, output um, properly set up and it is connected to the proper GPIO pins. So we're going to disable test mode and we're going to now configure our triggers. So in input output setup, we're gonna click on GPIO inputs. Now we have to um, figure out which color button goes to which input, right? As we saw um, in the previous video, uh, the LED will illuminate on the Pi Hat saying which input was activated for each of those buttons. And it also gives you a GPIO number as well as the pin number. So for the white button, it was pin 18 GPIO 24, which is this one right here. And we're going to do a pull down resistor on that guy. And we'll call this white button. And then 
Uh, we're not going to do a command just yet. We're just setting these up first. And then the blue button, uh, that was pin 16, GPIO 23, which is right above it. So this was the blue button. Blue button. And the yellow was pin 11, GPIO 17. So this is yellow button. And we had green, which was pin 13, GPIO 27, which is this one. Green button. And for the red, it was pin 15, GPIO 22, red button. All right, we'll put pull downs on these as well. And hit save. Uh, anytime you make changes here, you're gonna need to restart FPPD, which is pretty quick. All right, so we have um, the individual GPIOs. They, have, they aren't doing anything yet. Um, in their off state, in their default state, they are pulled down to ground. So what we wanna do is say, when the rising edge occurs, there is going to be some sort of command. And this can do all sorts of things. We are not getting into all of this. We're gonna just be showing you how to play a simple, um, a simple uh, FSEQ file. Um, so this uh, can do a lot more though. Um, for instance, if this FPP instance is driving your main show, you can actually still use the GPIO triggers to trigger effects. And these effects will be on top of your show. Your show will still be running, but this can run effects. Um, so definitely look up some tutorials on effects if you're not familiar, um, because these are pretty neat um, and powerful tools to allow you to overlay things on your already running show. So let's um, upload some content. I've already uh, created a few FSEQ files and I'm gonna just upload those so that we can run them. All right, those are all uploaded now. Now, if we go back to our GPIO inputs and we're going to map each of these to a, um, a play command. So we're going to play, excuse me, start playlist, start playlist. Now, you might be saying, David, I didn't create a playlist. Well, the cool thing about uh, FPP5 is you can actually start an FSEQ directly rather than at a playlist. So in this case, we're gonna start this playlist um, and it's going to be yellow and we're going to put it on repeat. Um, this specific sequence is I think 60 seconds long that kind of fades in and fades out. So it'll just repeat forever um, until another button is pushed. And we're also gonna check if not running, because what that will do is if you have a little kid coming up and tapping the button over and over and over again, it's not gonna keep restarting that yellow sequence. It's only going to start the yellow sequence if it's not already running, which is a really neat feature. All right, so we're gonna do the rest now and map the appropriate sequence to each of the colors. All right, that seems to be correct. So we'll hit save, restart FPPD, and that's it. The configuration of FPP is, is very simple, very straightforward. Um, and as you can see, as we press each of the corresponding buttons, it starts the appropriate FSEQ file. If you do have questions about FPP, make sure and post them to the Facebook group, the Falcon Pie Player Facebook support group, and there's lots of people on there that can help you out. <laughs>